Hey everyone, this is Bonnie Gasper with the Child Protection League. We're pleased to present a new presentation protecting our children from vulgar books. We have a lot to discuss. This whole book thing has really opened the eyes of parents all around the country and it's an opportuni opportunity to explain to parents how do we get to this point? Because bad books are just one front of a massive offensive against our children. It's critical that you understand the war we are in because what we're dealing with is so much bigger than bad books. So with that, let's just dive in. When Child Protection League hosted its first major event back in 2014, we called it the Raging War on Kids. We recognized long ago that we were in the middle of a culture war and our kids were the targets. The change agents are after our children to indoctrinate them throughout their entire education so they leave us radicalized, controllable activists. And this war is only ramped up, so we updated our mission statement to reflect this. But CPL is committed to promoting the welfare of children and protecting them from exploitation, indoctrination, and violence. We educate citizens on issues that protect or threaten the safety of children. We equip and activate parents and the public to reclaim self-governance and to expose and defeat the cultural revolution in our midst. And we do this simply by following cultural trends, public policy, legislation, education, and curriculum. And then we educate and equip parents and the public about these issues. We're a nonprofit that originally formed in 2013 to defeat the Safe and Supportive Schools Act, which we renamed the Bullying Bill. It was not a popular position to be against, you know, to be an anti anti bullier, but we knew the bill established a huge new bureaucracy whose purpose was to codify into law all of the things that we're fighting today. It defined gender non conforming people as oppressed with special protections. It defined normative heterosexuality, in other words, mom and dad, you know, the nuclear family as an oppressive belief system. It mandated school instruction in gender ideology. It was going to enforce compelled speech and it was undermining parental rights. And by now, hopefully you are all familiar with critical race theory, equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, the entire LGBTQ agenda, comprehensive sex ed, and SEL, which is a mechanism being used to bring all of the above into our school. Now we're not going to dive into that in detail tonight because it's an entire presentation of its own, but SEL is psychosocial ideology posing as academic instruction. What it does is it assesses the values, attitudes, and beliefs of children through constant surveys, data collection, and behavioral interventions because its end goal is to create social justice global citizens who will champion the UN Sustainable Development Goals of Agenda 2030. I know that sounds like a bold statement, but we have the receipts to prove it. So despite the fluffy language, SEL is very bad. But add to this vulgar books, and you can see that education is literally saturated with indoctrination. It's a worldview which runs counter to science, truth, and reality, and morality. Because you must understand that all of those things are all just fronts, again, of the same war. We're in the midst of a cultural revolution. This is a revolution that seeks to fundamentally transform America by fundamentally transforming the worldview of children. So while each of these battlefronts are worthy fights, we have to understand they're all connected. They're all part of the same war. They're all heads of a multi-headed hydra. And we have to cut off every head of this hydra to kill off this beast of cultural Marxism. Which leads us into one of our main questions. How is it that our school libraries are filled with pornographic and vulgar books anyway? How did liter literary trash like that get past the gatekeepers? Was it an accident? Was someone just not paying attention? Or have we evolved so much that it's now necessary to expose our kids to hardcore porn? To understand this, I think it's going to be helpful to take a brief look at the history of education in America, how we went from kids actually using Bibles as textbooks 100 years ago to reading trash novels now that are glorifying incestuous sex. Well, that's when the Marxist intellectuals began taking over education. Now we're going to take a brief look at some of the most influential. George Lukacs was from the late 1800s. He's considered one of the main founders of Western Marxism and the inspiration behind the Frankfurt School. But Lukacs understood that Christianity and Western civilization, i.e. the nuclear family, were obstacles to communism, and he asserted that both had blinded the working class to its true Marxist class interests. And like the voices of the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, he was a globalist and advocated for the destruction of Western society and old values in order to create, or as the globalists say today, build back better new ones. This was the Great Reset. This was cultural Marxism. 
Wilhelm Reich, he's another highly influential psychoanalyst, Marxist and sexual revolutionary from the early 1900s. He greatly influenced the Frankfurt School. He wrote in his book, The Sexual Revolution, that the sexualization of the culture was necessary to destroy the social order and the family. He viewed the nuclear family as, an, as oppressive, so he said we had to replace it with a classless society. He's known as the father of the sexual revolution, and he taught that sexual revolution would be accomplished primarily through the sexualization of children. The Frankfurt School was founded in 1923 in Germany with the goal of destroying Christian culture in Germany. But ironically, they had to flee when Hitler came to power because each member was not only a Marxist, but a Jew. So they reestablished in Columbia University, which is still the largest graduate school of education in the U.S. today, and just simply changed their focus to destroying Christian culture in the U.S. But they realized the U.S. working class was a little different. They were not just going to take up arms and overthrow their government because Americans they were aspiring to the middle class. Middle class Americans actually believed in capitalism and a good work ethic, and they wanted to create a more prosperous future for their children. So instead, they had to organize people into groups like blacks, feminists, and homosexuals, and students, and then convince them that they were victims and marginalized. They were really just nothing more than agitators and community organizers. And they had tactics or strategies they identified as effective in destroying the Christian culture in America. I'm going to play you a shortened clip from just this past Good Friday in uh, April of 2023 episode on War Room, where Ben Harnwell and Steve Bannon were discussing cultural Marxism in the Frankfurt School for two reasons. Number one, it's pretty cool when what we're talking about is validated by heavy hitters like the War Room. And number two, I think it's just more interesting to listen to someone with a British accent. But Harnwell asks the very same question I do. How successful have they been? Steve. They needed a sense of hopelessness so that people would give up in the system and embrace the Marxist revolution. And this is what the Frankfurt School, back in when it was in its original founding in um, 1923, realised that their big task was, right, was to destroy the, the, the Judeo-Christian and um, civilizations. It was, a, it was a, a source, a spring of hope. They needed to destroy that in order to leave the people helpless. Now, what was their strategy? Here's something I'm going to list off, and you can tell me where you think we are on this list, OK? The creation of racism offences. Continual change to create confusion. The teaching of sex and homosexuality to children. The undermining of schools and teachers' authority. Huge immigration to destroy identity. The emptying of churches. An unreliable legal system with bias against victims of crime. Dependences, dependency on the state and state benefits, control and dumbing down of media and the encouraging of the breakdown of the family. So I'll let people uh, calculate for themselves how successful that very radical plan has been. OK, so that's the Marxist. That's the Marxist school, right? Now. Then a 1930s Italian communist by the name of Antonio Gramsci came on the scene. He's credited with the long march through the institutions. His educational philosophy and tactics were fully embraced throughout American higher ed in the 1960s. But he believed that culture, not economics, was a center to any revolution because whoever controls the social institutions would ultimately control the rest of society. And his approach to education was pretty simple. He said, if you can change how children think and speak, you will create social change. He knew you had to capture the children to revolutionize the culture. He's also known as the father of cultural Marxism. But his long march was simple, yet strategic. First, you had to change and deconstruct the language because what we say, how we speak, ultimately shapes what, how we think. How we think and speak then starts to change the cultural narrative by the words we are all using. And the leftists today, they use the same words we do, but they are using a, an entirely different dictionary. We must recognize they have co-opted the language to mean things that it doesn't. It's linguistic theft. And Gramsci said that truth had to be relative and personal, not objective and absolute. No Marxist believed in God. They believed man was his own God. So there could be no standard by which we are all held to account. So anything goes. Things like teaching kids that you can change your sex. And like all true Marxists, Gramsci also knew you had to, had to create and place people into oppressor or victim identity groups. 
And then he had to emphasize power and group consciousness according to these identity groups. And again, you have to remove individuality and personal responsibility. Does this sound familiar? He understood education was the key to creating cultural revolution. Think of it like a covert operation. It's like biting into an apple that looks pretty good on the, on the surface, but once you bite into it, you discover the core has rotted from the inside out. Vulgar books also have Alfred Kinsey's fingerprints all over them. He's known as the father of comprehensive sex ed and the gay rights movement, but Kinsey was a monster. Kinsey was a sexual psychopath. He was a promiscuous homosexual, a sadomasochist, porn addict, pedophile, and professor at U Indiana University. In 1948 and 53, he published his so-called research, which became known as the Kinsey Reports. Well, his research normalized the abnormal because his subjects were primarily convicted sexual felons and homosexuals. He hired hundreds of pedophiles to sexually assault children, including babies using stopwatches, and he documented, again, this so-called research in his own charts, the now infamous Table 34. Now, if you've ever wondered where the claim that children are sexual from birth came from, it came from this table, from Kinsey, literally sexually abusing children. And note the ages of some of these, these babies. He counted their screams, their crying, their writhing in agony as sexual responses or orgasms. I mean, it's just unbelievable that nobody put this man in jail. But instead, his research was embraced as groundbreaking. Planned Parenthood is a player, too. Margaret Sanger on the left, she founded Planned Parenthood in 1916. She was a member of the Population Congress and a full-on racist eugenicist who built abortion centers in impoverished areas with the deliberate intention of exterminating minority children. In her own writings, she intended to exterminate the Negro population. It was called the Negro Project. Fast forward just a couple of decades into 1964 when Kinsey's diabolical research had taken academia by storm, his, or, his associate Wardell Pomeroy then partnered with Dr. Mary Calderon. She was the medical director of Planned Parenthood at the time, and they created CECUS. This is a sex ed arm of the Kinsey Institute. But Calderon, she was another radical who believed the Bible was a myth. She promoted adolescent sexual experimentation, sexual freedom for youth, and that infant, infant, and childhood sexuality should be taught through CECUS. And Planned Parenthood is not only an abortion mill, it's a powerful sexual advocacy organization. The International Planned Parenthood Federation is a massive NGO of 120 organizations, including the U.S. branch of Planned Parenthood, and they operate in 146 countries. But they teach CSE from Kinsey's perspective that children are sexual from birth and they have sexual rights. Again, we're talking about children. From the Scaling Up uh, CSA Toolkit, which was on the previous page, this is their teacher's guide. And they have key learnings here for children under 10. They include that they are sexual from birth and their sexuality can change. They may also become attracted to diverse gender identities and it's, and it's all perfectly normal. They have sexual and reproductive rights that cannot be taken away from them under any circumstances. Sexual activity can include relationships, dating, marriage, and commercial sex work, among others. So 10-year-olds are taught there are lots of options outside of marriage, including prostitution. And they're explicitly taught they have the right to abort a baby they don't want. Conspicuously absent, though, from these key learnings are references to parental authority. Any law which protects requirements for parental consent, access to their child's medical records, and authority over their minor children. So Planned Parenthood is not working to support parental rights. They're actively working against you. Which brings us into CECUS, the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the U.S. This is the organization then that was founded upon the work of Marxist-influenced racists, pedophiles, and abortionists. All right, so what possibly could go wrong? And they openly admit their agenda. On their website, they rebranded in 2019, and they stated that sex ed is their vehicle for social change. Now, CECUS has enormous influence. They write the majority of sex ed curriculum and teacher training standards for the U.S. and the world. And their CEO just says sex ed can spark the social change we need. That's why they're now CECUS, sex ed for social change. She goes on to say, from now on, you will rarely see our name without our tagline, because it is more than a phrase, it's a promise. They want a world where all people, including children, can experience and enjoy sexual and reproductive freedom as they define it for themselves. 
So by advancing sex ed for social change, we know that we can make that world a reality. So do you hear it? Do you see it? This total obsession with the sexualization of children is their main tool then to accomplish the social change they want. This is to change how they think, speak, and believe. It's about their fundamental identity to change their worldview. And when you accomplish that, you achieve their ultimate goal, which is revolution. So the bottom line, they want to create a horde of sexually active youth who rebel against authority, who are hostile toward the oppressive heteronormative definition of family, who reject societal boundaries and American institutions, and who literally celebrate gender chaos and trust feelings over facts and reality. And most importantly, these are going to be kids who think they are liberated and free when in fact they're actually enslaved. And as we've seen, this revolution is deliberately confusing children about the most basic essence of their being, the very truth about who they are. Again, it's their primary battle strategy because kids are just a captive audience. It makes them really easy targets. And we have a whole crop now of revolutionaries who have marinated in this indoctrination their own entire educational career. And now they've graduated and taken positions in education, government, Hollywood, corporate America, etc. All of the spheres of influence. Now let's hear a couple of them in their own words. Uh, this is a teacher from Moundsview Elementary School in Minnesota. One of my coworkers told me that they were talking to some students in the hallway. And they asked, the students asked the other teacher if I'm a boy or a girl. And the teacher was like, does it matter? You know, she's cool. And they were like, no, I just, I just can't figure it out. It's just so hard. I can't figure it out. It's just so hard. I can't figure it out. That's the goal. That's the goal. Hmm. Yeah, her goal is to confuse your children. Or how about Jason Buckland, the LGBTQ program coordinator for Minneapolis Public Schools? Now listen for some of the key concepts that he's pushing. Now this was a video compilation that was tweeted out by Liberty Loca from the from Buckland's recent ed talk. The top three because those have to do with gender, right? Those have to do with gender. So I'm going to start with sex assigned at birth because that's often where we have our own understanding of, of gender. We tie it to the sex assigned at birth, which is often just really decided by the doctor um, at looking at anatomy. My name is Jason Buckland. I use he and him pronouns, and I'm the LGBTQ program coordinator with Minneapolis Public Schools. Uh, people might assume it's a relatively new program um, and that the work is primarily for high schoolers. Um, we really see the work as starting um, as early as pre-K and as early as pre-K. Okay, so inclusive curriculum. Another one is uh, called Neither. Uh, and this has been really great because we've been having questions about how do we explain non-binary identities to our preschoolers. If a teacher is, doesn't identify as a boy or a girl, how do we explain that to preschoolers who are just learning that there's only boys and girls? This is how we can do some really great inclusive curriculum in, in early education. So preschool, kindergarten, and on. And it's just using books. This uh, graph has a male category, a female category, and then if those words don't really work for you, there's a other category as well. Lean in and experience discomfort, right? And discomfort is where learning happens. Some folks might be like, I think about how gender impacts my life every day. <laughs> I've talked about this. I have a gender unicorn in my classroom. I know this. So having the privilege to um, uh, purchase a chest binder, purchase a chest binder, or purchase jewelry, right? So sometimes we might meet students or meet people who uh, provide us with a pronoun that maybe just based on expression and the way our brains are wired, we don't understand or read. But it's also just up to us to just still acknowledge what they told us and respect them, right? And use the pronouns that they ask us to. <laughs> so did you hear what he said? Gender assigned at birth. Apparently the doctor just looks at anatomy and randomly assigns a gender. Gee, imagine that. Um, he talks about pronouns, uh, that their work starts in preschool, and that it's primarily through the use of books. So with that background, then, let's take a look at the history of the American Library Association and the AASL. These are the people that are choosing and placing books in front of your kids. 
At the 2003 convention, which was held in Toronto, Canada, it was actually dedicated to celebrating Castro's library policies. However, they invited only Cuban official libraries to present and did not invite anyone from the 150 so-called independent libraries. It was common for Castro to frequently pretend there was actually freedom in Cuba, and in 1988 he allowed independent libraries to form, um, but their books came primarily from private donors, embassies, tourists, and so forth. He famously said there were no forbidden, forbidden books, just no money to buy them. So it is remarkable, however, that a 2001 ALA delegation to Cuba then found no censorship, despite having received explicit instructions from the Cuban government which forbid them from bringing any of their own books into the country. And in 2002, at least 10 independent librarians, along with journalists and other political dissidents, were imprisoned for 20 to 26 years. And the police raided some 22 of the independent libraries, often burning them to the ground. Quite amazing. They didn't see any issues with that. Then we have Drag Queen Story Hour, which these were started in San Francisco by Michelle T., who is a professing lesbian. And they were marketed as inclusive and welcoming for little children. Now, these are photos from Drag Queen Story Hours in Minneapolis-St. Paul area in 2019. But during these story hours, these drag queens read only books about gender identity to our little kids. It's a mockery of women, and I'm glad that some are now starting to call it the new black face of women. Because women in general don't wear slutty clothes. We don't twerk, spread our legs, and stroke ourselves in front of small children. And Sasha Soda, the guy in the miniskirt upper right, when a man flashes his crotch at children, it's generally considered a criminal act. So when grown men then dress as hypersexualized women, dance and prance and twerk and stroke themselves in front of small children, I think a fair question to ask is who's actually getting the pleasure out of that? Then at the 2019 ALA convention, it was devoted to querying the library offerings. That was actually their own language. But they conducted over 100 workshops, which were specifically devoted to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, again, they have this total obsession with dividing children by skin color and emphasizing oppression and systemic racism. You know, DEI demands acceptance for every gender identity. It demands acknowledgement that every non-white, non-hetero identity is inherently victimized and oppressed, and that inclusion means more than just tolerance. Tolerance isn't good enough. Inclusion means full acceptance. You must celebrate and advocate. Otherwise, you're not an ally. You're an enemy. And then they had two sessions called A Child's Room to Choose, Encouraging Gender Identity and Expression in School and Public Libraries. And are you going to tell my parents? The minor's right to privacy in the library. They also held several sessions providing tools, strategies, and communications that were teaching the librarians how to overcome community objections to Drag Queen Story Hour and other pushback. Now, you may find it very illuminating that requiring parental permission to access certain content was identified as one of the, main, as the five main types of censorship at this conference. One of the key takeaways was that they were taught how to prepare materials to support the ALA's values, not parents or the community, but the ALA's values. So yes, Dorothy, we are not in Kansas anymore, and the ALA has an agenda too, and it looks nothing like yours. So with that background, then, is it any wonder that the new ALA president-elect is Emily Durbinski. She'll begin serving her term in July of 2023. And she describes herself as a Marxist lesbian. In a tweet from 2022, she said, I just cannot believe that a Marxist lesbian who believes that collective power is possible to build and can be wielded for a better world is the president-elect of ALA. The Federalist wrote an article about her as well and quoted from a lecture she gave in 2021 called Teaching the Radical Catalog. Drabinsky spoke about pointing students towards books that would lead them to their brand of queerness. She said at Sarah Lawrence, absolutely everybody was queer. There were so many ways to be gay, and it was my job to teach those students how to find themselves in our library catalog. In that same talk, she explained that queerness included the subversion of those kinds of normal family types. Now, Drabinsky was referring to the family types that normally produce children, you know, a married man and woman. And subversion is a pretty strong word. It actually means sabotage, as in destruction. The act of destroying or damaging something deliberately so that it does not work correctly. I'm um, Seriously, can you hear the old Marxists from 100 years ago? And they're not even trying to hide it. Drabinsky now was just announced as one of the keynote speakers for the Socialism 2023 conference in September 
in Chicago. Now, I'd like you to also to listen to a few excerpts from her interview with uh, this interview with Emily Dravinsky. Listen to how she sees book challenges and the parents who bring them. Now is Emily Drabinsky. She's a librarian at the CUNY Graduate Center and has also been elected to serve next year as the president of the American Librarian Association. When we think about book bans, the sort of moral panic that we see happening across the country right now is one aspect of that book ban efforts there, which aren't just, you know, sort of we're against an individual book and sort of filing a petition, but it involves armed uh, Christo fascist right wing sort of extremists bringing guns to public meetings, staking out the library director's home. Like, it's really quite violent. These challenges seem so much more intense over the past few years. From your perspective, what's changed? I think that we have sort of allowed a kind of public violence that is new. And we haven't sort of framed the attacks on library workers as a form of domestic terrorism, as a kind of violence against public sector workers that needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed really head on and directly. That when the right showed up about a drag queen story hour and like who could be against story hour, right? It's just baffling to me. So how does the, uh, the Library Association um, think about parental involvement and parental control? Well, I mean, parents are responsible for parenting their children, and we are, as libraries, responsible for providing resources and support for the public project of raising children. Um, we have policies, right? Most libraries have po challenge policies, and it's our task to defend the policy, not the book. Um, you know, and so those exist in libraries. But I would also say, if you don't want your kid to read that book, then make sure that they don't check it out. And, you know, the other thing I would say is one of the principles of uh, librarianship is that every reader has a right to decide for themselves what they read. And that includes children. He has a right to a private life as a reader, just like I do. You know, so that interview lasted 28 minutes. Not once did, did, they, did they discuss the elephant in the room that parents object to the content, the vulgar and pornographic content. And she also equated opposition to trans books as the same thing as black and brown racism. But did you also hear what she said? Parents opposing books are Christo fascist domestic terrorists bringing guns to libraries and violent. So if you didn't think you were in a war, she certainly does. She sees the ALA as the front line of pushing this Marxist agenda and parents opposed to it as the enemies that need to be stopped. Because libraries apparently are, the, are part of the public project of raising your children. So because of all this pushback they've been receiving, they have formed a group called Unite Against Book Bans, a group, again, that is heavily supported by all kinds of lefties, GLSEN, GLAD, People for the United Way, the Human Rights Campaign, the American Federation of Teachers, et cetera, et cetera. And just as Drabinsky is doing, they define opposition to their agenda, again, as book bans. They totally ignore parental objections to the pornographic and vulgar content of these books. And they won't, because it's an, un it's an unwinnable argument for them. It's much easier to garner public sympathy by twisting the argument, painting you as angry and narrow-minded cretins who are banning books and thereby robbing children somehow of literary options. Because you're the one advocating for censorship, right? So they present themselves as defenders of free speech. They're fighting censorship, so they're the heroes. So do you see what they just did there? I mean, they've just flipped the script by ignoring the real issue. But do you get the picture here? So every single organization with direct influence on what you're t is being taught to your kids is promoting racial division and the sexualization of your children. So do you see what your child is up against? Do you see the terrain more clearly? Do you see the size and scope of this war? Can you see now why 70% of millennials are now in favor of socialism? Or why almost 40% of Gen Zs identify as somewhere on the LGBTQ spectrum? And can you see now why 673 university professors just said requiring a three-credit course on American history and its finding documents was nothing but indoctrination? And in 2019, according to the nation's report card, the NAEP, two-thirds of eighth graders were not proficient in any subject. And, you can, and can you see now why it seems like everything has gone woke at the same time, like it's a hive mentality? Do you see why I need to do something? Because this is a public education system. We already know that colleges were captured decades ago. 
And what about porn? We should talk about this. Do pornographic images and content negatively impact children? Well, we already know porn destroys adults in their relationships, so why would it be any different for children? Porn destroys their minds, their souls, and the change agents know this, but pretend that without this explicit content that somehow your child's going to be left wanting. That they will not have information to be safe and to make safe choices, or worse, that you're some kind of, again, backward prude for wanting to protect your child's mind from this kind of content. But what does porn do to the brain? Well, it desensitizes them to sexual situations, which often leads to acting out these same sexualized scenes or encounters with other kids. In fact, one of the fastest growing crimes in America right now is children sexually assaulting other children. And viewing unfamiliar bodies acting in ways that they don't understand creates shock and fear. And sexual arousal from these images can be very confusing for a child who doesn't understand what they're watching or seeing or reading. Everybody, including children, have a peripheral nervous system that regulates involuntary physiological processes like heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, digestion, and sexual arousal. So for children who aren't getting other forms of sex education, watching or reading porn can teach them that sex and love do not coincide. And it most definitely promotes the objectification and skewed view of what makes for a healthy sexual relationship. And viewing porn at a young age activates the fight or flight response, which could then create anxiety and an emotional attachment actually to similar images. Fight or flight is an acute stress response and another physiological reaction that occurs when one encounters something that's mentally or physically terrifying. And the visual stimulus of pornography, it hijacks the brain's reward system and it overwhelms it with unnatural prolonged dopamine levels. The result is the brain physically deteriorating in shape, size, and chemical balance. It also erodes the prefrontal cortex, the key region of the brain that houses executive functions like morality, willpower, and impulse control. And it hijacks the neural wiring, the plasticity of the brain. Neural, neural wiring that underlies learning and memory processes. The brain is wired to respond to sexual stimuli with surges of dopamine. So this is, this is like reward anticipation, and it programs memories and information into the brain. And the body adapts to this, to these brain signals. So like, you know, so like food and sex, the brain remembers where to return to experience the same pleasure. Psychiatrist Norman Doige explains that pornography satisfies every one of the prerequisites for neuroplastic change. When pornographers boast that they are pushing the envelope by in introducing new, harder themes, what they don't say is that they must because their customers are building up tolerances to the content. Case in point, Pornhub analytics show now that conventional, you know, pornographic sex is boring to its users, who are now consuming more violent and incestuous sex. And because dopamine transmission is so messed up, consumers of porn report far more depression, anxiety, and lower quality of life. And all of this is only magnified in children. So again, why would anyone defend kids having access to porn. If you want to research this issue more on your own, this is a really good place to get information. The National Center of Sexual Exploitation, NCOSE. Tons of good information on their site. One of their reports, The Pornography, Addiction, and Destruction of the Innocence. The link is on the right. And they have another here, uh, How Pornography Affects More Than the Brain. But the bottom line is children are exceptionally vulnerable. Not only are they immature, they're extremely susceptible to whatever they're exposed to. They cannot distinguish between reality and fantasy. Their minds are like wet cement. Whatever lands on them leaves a permanent impression. So this highly sexualized curriculum, these pornographic and vulgar books, this is the definition of grooming. According to 2002 congressional testimony from the FBI Division for Crimes Against Children, predators groom their targets by desensitizing them to sexual imagery and pornography. This obviously wears down their natural protective boundaries and their trust. And since curriculum and books use these very same tactics, how is it, how is it that passed off as education or literature when both common sense and the law recognize this as grooming? And when vulgar books normalize and celebrate sexual experimentation of all kinds, what does this kind of grooming do to its victims? Well, it leads to increased drug use. It leads to unplanned pregnancies and all that comes along with those very difficult situations. It leads to more children becoming vulnerable to depression and suicidal ideation, makes them vulnerable to sexually transmitted diseases, exploitation, and sexual abuse. 
And in the case of normalizing all things trans, Utilating surgeries, infertility, a lifetime of medical intervention, and extremely high rates of suicide. So again, how do children benefit from being exposed to porn? So what can you do? Well, I think we have to call it what it is. At worst, it's sexual grooming. At best, it's simply people being derelict in their duty or too afraid to stand up and protect kids from harmful content. But I think we have to call it out. Groomers hate this term because parents understand it. We know what this means. And you have the law on your side. Pervasively vulgar books can be removed immediately. In the 1982 Board of Education versus Pico case, the court ruled that pervasively vulgar books may be removed from the school forthwith. The books in question are pervasively vulgar. That is the basis for the removals, not that the ideas they contain, uh, would, the removal of which Pico would not allow. But the plurality, meaning the opinion of the court, also tells us that a book may be removed from a school library if it is pervasively vulgar. What does pervasively vulgar mean? Well, a 1978 case explained it. It said that vulgarity might be concentrated in a single poem, or a single chapter, or a single page, yet still be inappropriate. Or a school board might reasonably conclude that even random vulgarity is inappropriate for teenage school students. A school board might also reasonably conclude that the school board's retention of such books gives those volumes an implicit endorsement. But the key points here again, pervasive doesn't mean the whole book. If a skunk dies in your wall, he may be located in just your wall in one location, but the stench is going to permeate your whole house. So vulgar is the key word. Librarians often try to argue the word obscene, which is harder to prove and has for more First Amendment protections because with the word obscene, as a whole has standing. It would mean that the entire book had no literary or artistic value. So that's why vulgar, even a little bit, is a game changer. And vulgar is the most recent case law, too. And who has authority to remove books? Well, in the Pico case, the court unanimously acknowledged that the school board does. They have the authority to remove a vulgar book right away. School officials may remove books which are pervasively vulgar or deemed educationally unsuitable immediately. And a vulgar book removal does not require an arduous process. One individual can do it. Another case, um, the 2003 United States for the, versus the ALA. This was a case mostly about uh, the ALA Bill of Rights and somehow having some kind of rights to reading whatever they want in the library. But according to the ALA, uh, they say a person's right to use a library should not be denied or abridged because of origin, age, background, or views. Well, the court unanimously agreed that government has substantial interests at stake to protecting young library users from material that's inappropriate for minors. And they also ruled that the ALA Bill of Rights has no constitutional standing or merit. In other words, it's basically meaningless for everyone except the ALA. So a quick review of the deception, deflection, and the truth. They tell you that books must be obscene as a whole. False. They only need to be pervasively vulgar. They say it must require a rigorous process for removal. That also is false. Because I'll tell you what, um, I, think, I think you'll be hard-pressed to find a rigorous process for inclusion. In fact, you need to find out even if there's really a parent community open meeting on curriculum and books um, going on in your school. In a lot of cases, it's not. In a lot of cases, if they do, it's not even made public. Often, they will, they will like to invoke the uh, Miller process, which was another case, but that was about obscenity as a whole and not even school books. And they say, that well, the community is against book bans. Well, we are too, <laughs> but the community is also against explicit material. And I would encourage you to... Look for those surveys. What kind of questions did they ask? Because you can word questions in such a way that you can get the survey with manipulated results. You can get the answers that you want. And they say that one person does not have authority to remove a book. Well, yeah, they do. Because two of their own already have. Dorcas Hand currently sits on the board of the ALA's Freedom to Read, and the late Judith Krug, who was a cre actually the creator of Banned Book Week, have both done so. And they've explained how they've done it. They said they simply just read the book, deemed it to be inappropriate, and took it off the shelves. Not that difficult. So key points to emphasize again, we are not banning books. We oppose children being exposed to vulgar content. 
Don't be lured into the obscene discussion. We're talking about vulgar and pornographic content. As a whole, doesn't matter when we're talking about vulgar books. Like all Americans, we oppose book bans too. But like most Americans, we also overwhelmingly oppose explicit content being available to little kids in our schools. Uh, there's a Harris Poll and Rasmussen Poll that have documented this, and you can use that for your reference as well. And the ALA Bill of Rights, it doesn't really mean anything. So know the law and use it. Uh, take this before your librarian and your administration, and just don't be bullied. Now, you see a link at the bottom of this slide. Uh, this is a copy of an outline uh, that outlines these cases from our website. It explains many of the tactics they may try to use against you. And it's, um, I want to give a hat tip to Kathleen Nettiger of Mass Resistance and Dan Kleinman who put this thing together. Uh, Dan Kleinman is an attorney and owner of Safe Libraries Blogspot. He has many, many more links on his site and a lot of helpful tips and uh, for the outline as well. And so again, please download that from our website and just you know distribute that among your friends. And here are four solid resources that you could also use. Ratedbooks.org slash know before you read. Really good site. Um, they have read and identified vulgar and pornographic books, so they can take you right to the chapter and page. It's going to save you thousands of hours, and you don't have to read this garbage and fill your head with this kind of trash. And Safe Libraries, again, I mentioned that earlier, Dan Kleinman's blog. Um, being an attorney uh, provides really good analysis uh, for us to understand what's going on. And then No Left Turn in Education, they have linked to much of Rated Books' work, um, but they have a really easy format to follow. And then this site is very interesting, Destiny Discover. Apparently, this is a search engine that um, all public schools are on, so you can search by city and school to see if they carry certain book titles. Now, while we're dealing with the book issue, what are 10 things we could do right now as you work on this vulgar book issue? Well, first, again, I hope you know you, you see now. I hope you see better the terrain. I hope that the last 40 minutes have showed you how education has been totally subverted to achieve cultural revolution. I hope you see and understand that this war is much, much bigger than vulgar books. And as hard as it is to accept how far down the path that we, we are, uh, we have to comprehend it's real because they're not going to give up the terrain. They will not stop. They certainly are at war with you. And they're never going to stop. So we cannot sit by and just hope for the best and think that everything is going to you know, turn out fine and we're going to go back to normal because we're not. Those who are subverting your children use your language but not your dictionary. They fully understand the power of language. So what people say changes how they think. So we have to, again, recognize their tactics and strategically counter them and make them define words such as equity, safe space. Have them define what, what is a woman. What does inclusion mean? Don't participate in the delusion. Do not use their terms. And then judge and discern soberly the meaning of those realities in light of what you know to be true, especially from a Christian perspective. Uh, in late April, during his speech at the Heritage Foundation, Tucker Carlson nailed it. He said that good is characterized by order, calmness, calmness, tranquility, peace, whatever you want to call it, lack of conflict, cleanliness. Clen cleanliness is next to godliness. It's true. It is. And evil is characterized by their opposite. Violence, hate, disorder, division, disorganization, and filth. So if you are all in on the things that produce the latter basket of outcomes, what you're really advocating for is evil. It's true. I'm not making a partisan point at all. I'm just stating what's super obvious. So that was Tucker, and I could not agree with him more. Because what we are dealing with, folks, is evil. It's real, and it's just the truth. I highly recommend you listen to his entire 20-minute speech because it's excellent. And then you have to act. You have to understand that God chose you to be alive at this time. You have a mission specifically picked for you. You need to choose to resist evil and live by the truth. Because another thing Tucker said is the truth sets you free. The truth makes you stronger. And then get organized. Take what you have learned tonight from this group and tell two more friends over coffee or a church and so on and so on. You have the power, parents, and there is strength in numbers. And then network with other parent groups around the state and the country. Learn from what they're doing. Set up secure ways to communicate. There's always going to be trolls out there who are going to try to subvert you. Uh, so make sure that you um, have free ways to communicate with each other safely. And then attend school board meetings and get on curriculum um, and for... Um, curriculum review boards and for sure review committees book review committees and then make sure you have opportunities uh, that are made public 
and not just filled with their syncophants or hand-selected people. And then I would really encourage you to record some of these school board meetings if people show up to talk about these books. Because for some reason, surprisingly, they seem to always lose the tapes when parents show up with the bad material. And for sure, point out the inconsistencies in their policies. It is actually kind of mind-blowing uh, when you look at how absurd um, their policies are when it comes to these bad books. Then consider running for local office, school board, city commissioner. These local positions can be uh, can allow for great oversight and impact because the closer to local we are, the better off we are. And if you do decide to run for school board, be assured this book issue is going to be a tactic they're going to use against you. So be prepared with facts, information, and the correct talking points. Make them defend pornography and vulgar books. Make them defend having this available for minors in light of all we know of all the harms that we know it causes. Because in really, in all honesty, it's a truly indefensible position for people who are being intellectually honest. And then learn from others. We have so many great examples in history of people who have uh, lived through uh, revolutions like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, expose the lies and the liars, refuse to say what you don't think, again, don't participate in the delusion, refuse to let the media and institutions propagandize you and your children, uh, their number one tactic is to control you. It's fear. It's fear to control you. And they need you to be afraid. So don't fear. You have the Constitution and the truth on your side. And be confident. We are we the people. Most people are reasonable and most want to protect their kids. And then support leaving public schools, but stay involved. I mean, as you can see, the whole system is set up really set up to indoctrinate your child. So you have to make some, might have to make some hard decisions here. Uh, but investigate homeschooling and non-public schools. There are so many good options now. Online curriculum is very robust and teaching series from colleges like Hillsdale College are just exceptional. And if you have skills, consider tutoring. If you're good at math, history, writing, finance, carpentry, teach other kids. And by all means, read good books to kids. There are so much, there's so much good literature out there. And we have many lists available on our website as well. Form local education pods that really took off during COVID. Uh, form after school clubs, which teach American history, patriotism, book clubs, etc. And insist that your school elevates holidays, which foster patriotism. Make sure they get equal time. And then prevent and counter isolation, especially among youth. Um, feeling alone makes people really vulnerable to predators. Real-time FaceTime, in-person events, that put kids and people together, build strong families and relationships, and try to reduce um, time on devices, games, and apps, because so many of these social media sites are literally grooming sites that they're luring kids in. Neighborhood events, um, teach your kids how to discern the truth. Make sure they know that telling the truth makes them even more powerful. You don't have to remember lies when you're telling the truth. You just have to know the truth and stand firm on it. And here's the truth. Re truth can handle a few questions. It stands up under scrutiny, which is why they're always trying to censor and silence the truth. And bottom line, courage is contagious. And stranger danger actually it applies here. We had to talk to kids about the dangers in the culture before the culture gets to them. Uh, we have actually a really helpful tool on our website. Feel free to download that as well. And then you may have to daily deprogram your children if they're in public school. This is what the parents in the Soviet bloc countries did with kids in the government schools. They daily reviewed what the schools were teaching them, and then they corrected the errors to maintain their cultural heritage and expose a propaganda that was being taught to their kids. I actually have a dear friend who, did, who remembers this. She escaped Cuba as a child, but her parents were secretly homeschooling her and her sister, but she remembers they had to wear the public school uniform whenever they went out so they wouldn't be arrested. And then we must cultivate cultural mem memory. If we fight the system and don't backfill what's missing, we're going to lose our kids in the end anyway. So replace the bad with the good. Another example is Poland. They were literally wiped off the face of the map twice, but they came back strong because the Polish people maintained their identity, their culture, and their patriotism. They knew who they were, and they were proud of it. And they taught this heritage to their children. And our cultural heritage is preserved not just by learning facts, but by reliving them as well. So it's absolutely key our kids know that tr our true American history because it's been completely erased and defiled with CRT and bias. I mean, America's always been an idea. 
a really exceptional idea. We've not always uh, perfectly implemented these ideas, but we've also worked very hard to fix the problems. It's cost us a lot. Um, so I have booths at fairs, local events, and highlight this rich, rich heritage. And I tell you what, um, another thing, if drag queens can read stories at libraries, so can you. So read a famous speech or show a movie and uh, form book clubs. I did this with my own kids and they remain some of their best um, friendships and really fond memories. So in closing, one of my personal hero heroes is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a Lutheran pastor living in Germany during World War II. He actively worked to remove the evil in their midst, which was Hitler. But he famously wrote that silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. So we must act because inaction is going to cost us everything, our children and our future. Over 200 years ago, John Adams said, the source of our suffering has been our timidity. We've been afraid to think. So let us dare to read, think, speak, and write. So be encouraged by his statement. Truth tellers were attacked and censored then just as they are today. There's nothing new under the sun. Decades ago, when we were all still using checks, I borrowed a phrase from the Gipper, and I had to print it on mine. It's, it said, freedom is not free. Well, that was from his, taken from his famous speech where he talked about a young man named Martin Treptow who left his barber business to fight in World War I. He died on the Western Front, and on his body they found a journal with this written in the flyleaf. He said, America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost, as if the issue of the whole struggle depended upon me alone. Martin Treptow was clearly talking about enemies outside our borders, but today, our main enemies are within our borders. But the exhortation doesn't change, so parents, grandparents, everyone, we must win this war. Therefore, we must work, we must save, we must sacrifice, we must endure and fight cheerfully and do our utmost as if the whole struggle depended upon us alone. Well, that concludes my presentation. If you appreciate the work that we do, we would like you to share this video and visit our website for more information at childprotectionleague.com. Please sign up for our email alerts there as well. And please consider supporting us financially because we rely entirely on generous and faithful supporters like you. Thank you for listening.